ancient Greece, NATO, and the philosophers from the East. We are living in a world today that seems to be heading on a course of self-deletion or self-annihilation or another catastrophic event. Mankind has colonized every part of this planet, whether land or sea. They seem to adapt it to all of Earth's environments. Mankind has even accomplished the unthinkable and colonized space. Man went as far as the moon and Mars and surveyed those heavenly bodies. Now that mankind has utilize technologies to sustain his life on his planet right at the pinnacle of that moment it seems that he's also on the verge of annihilating himself from the very planet he needs to sustain his life world war one World War II, and now it seems we are on the verge of World War III. A war that many believe could extinguish life on this planet or unite mankind into one global civilization. Now that we have reached high noon and the point of no return, let us reflect upon the men and the institutions that brought us to this point. So this video, Ancient Greece, NATO, and the philosophers from the East, is a video about the men who brought us to an age of atomic warfare and a time where men dream of utopias. A time when men, by their own power, their own will, use science and technology to end poverty and wars and wielded technologies that gave them unlimited energy sources. This is their story. Universal Center for Renovation presents historical and biblical Israelites. This video is strictly for educational purposes and commentary. This video is of biblical and secular historical literature, so enjoy. Ancient Greece, NATO, and the philosophers from the East. This book has been dedicated to the historical and archaeological documentation of the early Aegean warrior from the year 5000 to 1450 BC. Well, the timeline isn't so important right now because it's been developed by men who believe in the scientific method. In this story, well, this history is about how the scientific method was developed and why. And most importantly, by who? Through the historians 
who do believe in the scientific method. We are led to believe that these men, these men of Greece, were the founders and greatest contributors to civilization, especially Western civilization. For we are taught that the men of Greece were the founders of Western civilization. And we are told or led to believe that Western civilization is the model of the global civilization that is to emerge after the cataclysmic event, World War III. To properly understand this history, we have to know that this system yielded the ideology, politically and socially, the global elite of our times today believe in. This is their philosophy. This is their system of thought. This is their world view. The elite, the illuminated ones, part of their philosophical point of view is secular humanism. Secular humanism is a philosophy, belief system, all life stance that embraces human reason, logic, secular ethics, and philosophical naturalism, while specifically rejecting religious dogma, supernaturalism, and superstition as the basis of morality and decision making. No one will believe that the men in this image set up that system. So who did and what really did happen in the Aegean a few thousand years ago? Circular humanism. Historical use of the term humanism reflected in some current academic usage is related to the writings of pre-Socratic philosophers or before Socrates. These writings were lost to European societies until Renaissance scholars rediscovered them through Muslim sources and translated them from Arabic into European languages. Thus, the term humanist can mean a humanities scholar as well as refer to the Enlightenment, Renaissance intellectuals, and those who have agreement with the pre-Socratic as distinct from secular humanists. The worldview of the illuminated ones developed from philosophers that taught before Socrates. And this knowledge or worldview was lost to Europe because Christian kings of Europe suppressed this thought and worldview. Secular humanism posits or assume that human beings are capable of being ethnical and moral without religion or belief in a deity. We don't need the commandments of God to tell us right or wrong. It does not, however, assume that humans are either inherently good or evil. Human beings are neither good or bad inherently, meaning there is no sin or fallen state that man is in. It's society, it's institutions that should be fixed, not people. Nor does it present human beings as being superior to nature. We are animals. Human beings are another form or a higher animal. Rather, the humanist life stance emphasizes the unique responsibility facing humanity and the ethnical consequences of human decision. 
human beings have to control the environment. They have to sustain the environment. The environment is more important than humans. And we have to make the right decisions and choices to protect the environment. Even if it's over humans. Fundamental to the concept of secular humanism is the strongly held viewpoint that ideology, be it religious or political, must be thoroughly examined by each individual and not simply accepted or rejected on faith. You have to decide what you believe. You have to make that choice. You have to make that determination. What's good or bad for you? Along with this, an essential part of secular humanism is a continually adapting search for truth, primarily through science and philosophy. We don't know what truth is, but we are searching for truth through science and philosophy, not the Bible, not history. We are still on the search for truth. Many secular humanists derive their moral codes from a philosophy of utilitarianism, which is a belief that something is good if it benefits and make the majority of people happy. Ethical naturalism or evolutionary ethics. Darwin socialism or social Darwinism, which means survival of the fittest. And some advocate a science of morality. So they are inventing new ways of discovering or justifying men actions from men point of views no higher authority than man himself this world view simply means the ends justify the means or man is the measure of all things mankind can determine what is good for them and if it takes a war atomic war to destroy what they believe are corrupt institutions, their institutions, bad economies, bad governments, along with their native populations. The end justify the means. To build a better world, you have to do what you have to do. So their vision of a world without God, built by man, that is their perfect society. A utopia from man's own views and visions of what is best for man. Some of the first victims of this ideology or worldview was the aborigines of Greece itself, the Bronze Age Greeks, the Pelasgians. The Pelasgians were Greek Bronze Age Greeks, the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. They lived in Greece from 750 BC to 1050 BC. The men who actually developed Secular humanism or view or philosophy or classical Greeks, also known as Hellenes. This philosophy started to take root in the archaic period of Greece, archaic Greece from 800 BC to 480 BC. But it really took root in the classical Greece period, 500 BC to 323 BC. But during the rise of Alexander of Macedonia, during the Hellenistic period of Greece from 323 BC to 31 BC, the Greeks spread this philosophical worldview to Europe, North Africa, 
and Southwest Asia. The Pelasgian is also known in the Bible as Javan. Before the Phoenicians, these people brought the nations of the Mediterranean together through merchandise, trading, and seafaring. Europe, Southwest Asia, and North Africa was brought together through these people, the Pelagians, the Aborigines of Greece. And during the classical Greek period, a people known as Hellenes, a collection of men from the East. They developed this idea of science and humanism, this worldview that dominates Western civilization today. These men are the fathers of the atomic age. J. Robert Oppenheimer is called the father of the atomic age. Then these men can be rightfully called the grandfathers of the atomic age. This is pottery from the classical Greek period. This image shows the men from the East and the diversity of classical Greek, the Hellenes, during the classical Greek period. These are the men from the East. The men who drove out the Aborigines of Greece, the Pelagians, and occupied Greece. The Aborigines of Greece, the Mycenaeans, knew of the spherical earth as well as the men of the East. They knew of the six continents and the seven seas. The philosophers from the East knew of the world called Achaemenae or the inhabited world. The world as they knew Europe, Asia, and Africa was fully mapped and charted. The Aborigines of Greece and the philosophers from the East also knew of the Americas, an area in the world they called Perosi. Perosi. And this is a map of Asia Minor, Turkey, and Asia Major, the rest of Asia, including Russia, China, India, Iran, Iraq, Israel, and Palestine, Syria, Saudi Arabia. This is the Great Divide, East versus West. Asia Minor or Turkey has always been considered a part of the Greek, European, Western world, while the rest of Asia, Asia Major, has been considered the East. Asia Minor the West, Asia Major, the East. In the last video, we actually showed the works or the complete works of Josephus, a first century Israelite historian who wrote about the prediction of Adam. For he wrote that Adam predicted the world would be destroyed by fire thus correctly predicting the atomic age or the time of atomic warfare. In the last video, it was shown that Plato and the classical Greeks studied the atom and subatomic particles. Their research would have a profound effect on the atomic age and the age of warfare 
with atomic weapons. And so Plato taught about a micro world or a world of subatomic particles or basically quantum physics. The men of the East, the philosophers of the East, studied philosophy, studied the atom, the makeup of nature, so they could rebuild the world anew. A world that they envisioned, a world in their image, a utopia, a perfect world. A world that they could control and dominate forever. They sought to create a world where the elites themselves would be God. NATO member states as of 2024. Member states of NATO. NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is an international military alliance consisting of 31 member states from Europe and North America. If an armed attack occurs against one of the member states, it shall be considered an attack against all members, and other members shall assist the attack member with armed forces, if necessary. The entirety of Turkey, or the nation state of Turkey, is a member of NATO. Turkey is a NATO member. Remember, in the Bible, and in the period of the classical Greeks, Turkey was known as Asia Minor. Turkey-NATO relations. So Turkey is part of NATO, part of the Western Alliance or Western Civilization. Asia Minor or in modern times, Turkey. Turkey and NATO. Turkey has been a member of NATO since 1952. Turkey has NATO's second largest army and is the host of the Allied Land Command Headquarters. Turkey sought to become a member of NATO because it wanted a security guarantee against a potential invasion by the Soviet Union, Russia, which is part of Asia Major. So Turkey is part of the West. Russia is part of the East. Turkey is Asia minor. Russia is part of Asia major. Another name for Turkey is Anatolia. Anatolia, also known as Asia minor, is a large peninsula or a region in Turkey constituting most of its contemporary territory. Geographically, the Antolian region is bounded by the Mediterranean Sea to the south, the Aegean Sea to the west, the Turkish Straits to the northwest, and the Black Sea to the north. The eastern and southeastern boundary is either an imprecise line from the Gulf of Eskadoran to the Black Sea, or the southeastern and eastern borders of Turkey, Anatolia, Turkey, Asia Minor. Different names for the same place. Turkey is a gateway between East and West. Turkey, a gateway between Europe and Asia. Turkey has always played a key role in international trade. From the ancient Silk Road, to modern transport corridors. The country remains a central hub for goods and services to this day. 
Turkey continues to serve as an important hub between Europe and Asia with rail freight. Transport plays a pivotal role in this. Geographical benefits. Turkey's unique location connects the major markets of Europe and Asia. So from the ancient Silk Road to modern transport corridors, this means that Turkey is a gateway between Europe and China, Russia, India. Turkey is a gateway between these regions. So Turkey played a special role in history because part of Turkey is in Asia and part of Turkey is in Europe. So Turkey has a role both in Europe and in Asia. It's the gateway between the two regions. So we're going to investigate or take a look at Turkey role in Europe because Turkey is part of the Western Alliance, NATO. Historically, Turkey or part of Turkey has always belonged to Europe. And there's a part that's always belong to the east let's take a look we understand the role that turkey played in goods and services from the silk road from the east to the west but what's not early understood is the role that turkey played in the movements of ideas from the east to the west so let's take a look the idea of the West, Western civilization, and its opponents, Eastern civilization, from Plato to NATO, David Gress. After World War II, the global elite sought international support for their ideas of a global society. Therefore, they sought to reform the educational system and change the curriculum from an Aryan-based system to a more historical fact-based history. Aryanism helped the global elite unite Europe. Europe became united under NATO and the EU. Now, the idea was how to unite the world, and Arianism could not be the platform. So, the global elite allowed certain information to go mainstream, information and knowledge that was known from the past but was suppressed. One of the books that was used to open up the minds of students and scholars and academics in America and around the world was written by a scholar by the name of Martin Bernal. The book was called Black Athena, and I believe Martin Bernal was Sephardic. And the book was subtitled The Afro-Asiatic Roots of Classical Civilization. But now was a left-wing China scholar, a veteran of campus protest against the Vietnam War, who had devoted a number of years to studying the Bronze Age of Greece, Egypt, and the Near East, so that he could rewrite its history to serve the agenda of contemporary black activism. This agenda was to serve the interests of the elite. But now argued that white scholars had constructed a self-congratulatory image of the ancient Greeks as white Europeans, as a uniquely creative people whose originality proved that Westerners were innately creative and who, thanks to this construct, could be appropriated as models and ancestors of a superior racist West. 
this idea had to be destroyed because the elite wanted to incorporate all nations into this global society. It's like watching Star Trek, where the world is one federated planet, where all the different nationalities are one people. So the idea of one group being a superior racist group had to be destroyed. And that could only be destroyed by allowing some truth from history to come out. In fact, but now maintained, Greek civilization was indeed unique. But its uniqueness was not due to any native excellence, nor were the Greeks white Europeans. Rather, Greek civilization was borrowed from and owed its essence to non-white people, Egyptians and Near Easterners. If the West continued to look to Greece for its origins, he implied it would find out that these origins were African and Asiatic. Greece civilization originated from Near Easterners. Near Easterners, this term implies Hebrews who were influenced by Canaanite, Egyptian, and Babylonian civilization. Black Athena. Black Athena, the Afro-Asiatic roots of classical civilization. Its three volumes, first published in 1987, 1991, 2006, respectively, is a controversial book by Martin Banal, proposing an alternative hypothesis of the origin of ancient Greece and classical civilization. Banal's thesis discusses the perception of ancient Greece in relation to Greece, North African and West Asian neighbors, especially the ancient Egyptians and Phoenicians. Under that term, Phoenicians include Hebrews, who he believes colonized ancient Greece. So he believes the Hebrews among other people, colonized ancient Greece. But now proposes that a change in the Western perception of Greece took place from the 18th century onward, and that this change fostered a subsequent denial by Western academia of any significant Egyptian and Phoenician influence on ancient Greek civilization. In the 18th century, the Germans taught that the Aryans colonized Greece and denied the true history of Greece itself. This led to World War I and II, but now was here to set the record straight. Before World War I, the Germans taught that the Aryan race was the ruling class of ancient Egypt, denying biblical and secular history. Ancient Egypt was a civilization of ancient Northeast Africa. It was concentrated along the lower reaches of the Nile River, situated in the place that is now the country Egypt. Ancient Egyptian civilization followed prehistoric Egypt and coalesced around 3100 BC, according to conventional Egyptian chronology. But the political unification of Upper and Lower Egypt under menace, often identified with Narmer, the history of ancient Egypt unfolded as a series of sable kingdoms interspersed by periods of relative instability known as intermediate periods. The various kingdoms fall into one of three categories. The Old Kingdom of the Early Bronze Age, the Middle Kingdom of the Middle Bronze Age, or the New Kingdom of the later or the late Bronze Age. One of the Near Easterners who influenced Greece and Egypt was Abraham, the Hebrew. The story of the life of Abraham as told in the narrative of the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible 
revolves around the themes of posterity and land. He is said to have been called by God to leave the house of his father, Terah, and settle in the land of Canaan, which God now promises to Abraham and his progeny. This promise is subsequently inherited by Isaac, Abraham's son by his wife Sarah, while Isaac's half-brother Ishmael is also promised that he will be the founder of a great nation. Abraham purchases a tomb, the cave of the patriarchs, at Hebron, to be Sarah's grave, thus establishing his right to the land. And in the second generation, his heir, Isaac, is married to a woman from his own kin, thus ruling the Canaanites out of any inheritance. Abraham later marries Keturah and has six more sons. But on his death, when he is buried beside Sarah, it is Isaac who receives all Abraham's goods, while the other sons receive only gifts. Abraham the Hebrew, a fresco from the ancient synagogue, the 2,000-year-old synagogue in the nation-state of Syria, Dera Europis. In the complete works of Josephus, just like Bernal taught, Abraham the Hebrew had a great influence on Egypt and Greece. For whereas the Egyptians were formerly addicted to different customs and despised one another's sacred and accustomed rites and were very angry one with another on that account, Abram conferred with each of them and confuting the reasoning they made use of everyone for their own practices demonstrated that such reasonings were vain and void of truth whereupon he was admired by them in those conferences as a very wise man, and one of great sagacity, when he discoursed on any subject he undertook, and this not only in understanding it, but in persuading other men also to assent to him, he communicated to them arithmetic, and delivered to them the science of astronomy. For before Abram came into Egypt, they were unacquainted with those parts of learning. For that science came from the Chaldeans into Egypt and from thence to the Greeks also. So Josephus is trying to make this point. For that science came from the Chaldeans. Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees into Egypt. Abraham went into Egypt and from thence to the Greeks also. In later times, the Hebrews went other groups of people colonized Greece. So this learning, this science flowed from the Chaldeans to the Egyptians to the Greeks, all under the influence of the Hebrews. And this is a map of archaic Greece from the year 750 BC to the year 500 BC. And to the right on the map in the circle, there's a region in Turkey called Ionia. Ionia is the land of the Ionians. And these are the Greeks of Asia Minor, of Turkey. Ionians. The Ionians were one of the four major tribes that the Greeks considered themselves to be divided into during the ancient period. Ionians defines several groups in classical Greece. They lived in a region of Ionia in Asia Minor. And this term could be used to describe all speakers of that Ionic dialect, rather natives or non-natives. In the broadest sense, it could be used to describe all those who spoke languages of the East Greek group, which included 
Attic. The Ionians moved to Attica and mingled with the local population of Attica, and many years later immigrated to the coast of Asia Minor, founding the historical region of Ionia. Ionian soldier, old Persian cuneiform, Yana, or Ionian, of the Achaemenid or Persian army, around the time of 480 BCE, from the tomb of Xerxes the first. The New American Cyclopedia, a popular dictionary of general knowledge, edited by George Ripley and Charles A. Banner, Volume 13, Pelagians, an ancient people who in prehistoric times occupied the Grecian Peninsula, the islands and coast of the Aegean, and portions of Asia Minor and Italy, Asia Minor, Turkey, today. So to understand, for us to understand a little bit about the division between the Aboriginal Greeks and the colonizers from the Near East and Egypt, we have to understand the language that they spoke. So we go to the complete Greek grammar for the use of learners by John William Donaldson. Confining our attention to the Greek language, we find that this language, as we have it, consists of two elements, the Pelagians, the Aboriginals, and the Hellenic, the Near Easterners. And Herodotus has informed us that the Hellenes or Greeks owe their greatness to a coalition with the Pelagians. The Pelagians, which means swarthy Asiatics or dark-faced men, were the original occupants and civilizers of the Peloponnese or Greece, which was called after their name and also many districts in northern Greece. These were afterwards incorporated with the Hellenese. Swabi Asiatics, Pelagians, dark faced men, were incorporated with the Hellenese, the Near Easterners who colonized Greece. The Pelagians are the Aboriginals of Greece, the original inhabitants of Greece. In this map, you can find the locations exactly where the Aborigines, Pelagians occupied. And as you can see, Greece proper, Asia Minor, and even in Crete. You can find this map in Wikipedia under the article Palestinians. The New American Cyclopedia, Volume 13, concerning the Palestinians. The Arcadians, Ionians, Ionians were the Greeks that lived in Asia Minor, Turkey, in Argives seem to have been Pelagian races. So the original Ionians were Pelagians. Attica was Pelasiac at a very remote period in the earliest population of Macedonia may have been of the same stock. So Alexander the Great in history, Alexander of Macedonia, his group of Greeks colonized Macedonia from an earlier group of Aborigines known as Pelagians. Alexander was not a Pelagians. He was a colonizer of the Pelagians or original Greeks land. 
Now, this is the point of this video. Where did the ideas of Western civilization and society, where did they originate from? Where did, did they come from? With the Greeks. Ionian school of philosophy, the Ionian school of pre-Socratic or before Socrates philosophy refers to ancient Greek philosophers or a school of thought in Ionia in the 6th century BC, the first in the Western tradition. The Ionian school included such thinkers as Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Heraclitus, Anaxagoras, and Archiclides. This classification can be traced to the dioxographer, Socian. Doxographer is an historian who gives his opinions about the lives or ideas of ancient philosophers. The dioxographer, Diogenes Laertius, divides pre Socratic philosophy into the Ionian and Italian school. The Italian school had members like Pythagoras, who was also one of these men or philosophers from the East. The Italian school was started from immigrants from Ionia. So the Italian school is a branch of the Ionian school of philosophy. The collective affinity of the Ionians was first acknowledged by Aristotle, who called them physiologoi, or natural philosophers. Physiologoi means physicist, but it actually means astrophysicist, because that's what these men, natural philosophers, were, astrophysicists. They are sometimes referred to as cosmologists, which is an astrophysicist, since they studied stars and maps. Maths meaning mathematics. And they gave cosmogonies, cosmogonies or origins of the origin of the universe. Like the book of Genesis, they sought to explain how did the universe come into being. And these men were largely physicalist who try to explain the nature of matter. Physicalist means that these men were materialist. So they studied theories on the atom and subatomic particles. Their Ionian school was mainly made up of men from the Near East who colonized the ancient Greeks. The origin of the Pelagians, the Aborigines of Greece, can be found in the Bible, the Torah, and the complete works of Josephus. Now they were the grandchildren of Noah, in honor of whom names were imposed on the nations by those that first seized upon them. Javet, the son of Noah, had seven sons. They inhabited so that beginning at the mountain Taurus in Asia Minor, Turkey, and Aminus in Syria, they proceeded along Asia as far as the river Tanis, the Don River of Russia, and along Europe to Cadiz, city in Spain, and setting themselves on the lands which they light upon, which none had inhabited before. They called the nations by their own names. But from Javan, Ionia, and all the Grecians are derived. 
Genesis chapter 10, the King James Bible, the Japhethites. Also, this can be found in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magad, and Madai, and Javan. Dr. William Smith's Bible Dictionary, Javan, a son of Japheth, Genesis chapter 10, verse 2 and 4. Javan was regarded as the representative of the Greek race. The name was probably introduced into Asia by the Phoenicians, to whom the Ionians were naturally better known than any other of the Hellenic races on account of their commercial activity and the high prosperity of their towns on the western coast of Asia Minor. The Greeks, the Ionian Greeks and the Phoenicians did not only have commercial ties, but they had philosophical ties. And many times the Hebrews, the Israelites, they were mistaken for Phoenicians. So the Ionian school of Turkey or Asia Minor, their top scholars or scientists or astrophysicists were of Phoenician origin or Hebrew origin. The Phoenicians were Canaanites. So these Ionian philosophers who were actual Hebrews were Israelites who followed Canaanite ways, customs, and philosophies. The New American Cyclopedia. Herodotus says that Greece was called Pelagia and includes under the common name of Pelagians. He includes the Athenians, the Arcadians, the Ionians of Asia Minor, Turkey, the Laminians, the Samothracians, and the Christonians. Thucydides, whose authority is of the highest weight, states that the Pelagians were only the most numerous of the many kindred races which inhabited Greece. They came from the east at a very early period, passing over from Asia Minor. And they did come from the east. These are the grandchildren of the son of the biblical Noah. So they came originally from the mountains of Armenia in the plains of Shinar or Babylonia to inhabit Greece. The New American Cyclopedia. In Greece proper, the Pelagians, they mingled with the Hellenes, who were colonizers from the east, and in Asia Minor with the Carians, and the Lydians, and the Phygians, while in Italy they were either reduced to the condition of serfs, or united with their conquerors to form a new people, the Latins. Their whole character, says Rolson, professor of history, was plastic and yielding, not firm, nor affirmative, and their fate was to furnish a substratum upon which stronger nationalities established and developed themselves. A substratum means foundation, which means that in these areas, in Greece and parts of Italy, these people were the or aborigines or the first people. Stronger nations came and established their nations on these people. So they were 
expelled out of Greece proper, Asia Minor, parts of Italy, expelled into the South Pacific areas, the Far East. The ones that were not expelled were absorbed into these stronger nations. The men who founded it, the philosophy that Western civilization is based on were not from Greece proper, but they were men from the Near East. And this history will show that this Ionian philosophy has influenced in the past and today the northern tribes of Israel and the southern tribes of Israel. In Ionia, the word Ion means the dove. In America, the United States of America, poetic name is Columbia, and that means the dove. <laughs>